So Aaron Thompson did not type into the post the one thing that I noticed about her as she was celebrating awareness and appreciation for senior living, but as she was wearing a great big kind of a leather letterman's jacket and she had flip up shades that are glasses, but then the shades come down and she mentioned someone who was on a show that would often wear those. And, you know, she had, she was all style. And thing I noticed was she was wearing bib overalls, but only one strap was attached. The other was hanging, hanging down. I'm like, Oh, I remember that somehow that went over from um, high school into college for me that she uh, that uh, she was demonstrating what I said. I had bib overalls. My my roommate did. The guys did. And that was one thing was to walk around with, with one side flopped down, kind of like, yeah, I'm so relaxed. I don't even have to <laughs> finish. And I was like, yes, that reminds me. And I told her, you know, she could be walking down my high school hallway and no one would have been the wiser. So they were having fun at her place. Betsy, this is amazing. Uh, you are doing what I have never done. And that is you are coming in on your phone. Steve Berger is waving from Atlanta. And Betsy, I did not go back and remind myself what everyone does. I even said to my husband yesterday, who is hubby producer D. Scott Smith, motivational listener. He has his own shows and he does things on Amazon Live and uh, really encouraged me to step forward. And that's how I get to meet people like Betsy and Joseph. And I go, Betsy, remind me what you do. I went, honey, she has a, a blog or something. I think she does a show. What in the world? So Betsy, since Joseph hasn't met you before and I need to be reminded, Go ahead and say what it is that you are doing in the aging, care, um, longevity, arena. And you can also talk about your path to this point if you would like to. Sure. Thank you, Christine, for inviting me on your panel. I'm very honored. I am uh, Betsy Wurzel Sloan. This is my married name. I go by Wurzel on uh, social media out of my dad's memory. I am host of Chatting with Betsy, which is on Passionate World Talk Radio Network. And I interview all different types of people, all walks of life. I also started, um, I created a support group on Facebook called Hashtag Kick Alzheimer's S Movement. And how did I get to name it that? I'll tell you. I'm a Jersey girl, folks. Please. I can say it straight up. <laughs> I was in my car one day. Uh, my husband, Matt, had early onset Alzheimer's. He died January 1st, 2020, after a 10-year battle. And I was contemplating how the railroad tracks would feel at work, versus summer versus winter. And I said, what are you doing, Betsy? What are you thinking? You got to get out of this hole and never go back in. And I said, either Alzheimer's was going to kick my rear end or I was going to kick its rear end. And people say, well, Betsy, how do you kick Alzheimer's ass? It's a disease. Well, I'll tell you how. You celebrate your life. Okay. You celebrate your loved one's life every single day. You celebrate every occasion. I'm so glad I did that. Doesn't matter they remember. You remember. You know you were married. You know you gave birth. It doesn't matter if they remember. I brought the party home to Matt. I'd buy balloons, cake, um, when he could no longer go out. But we went out as long as I could take him out. So do what you can do with your loved one. Well, they still can enjoy it. And Alzheimer's is very unpredictable. You don't know how that progression is going to speedball. And I just recommend, you know, living your life 
And, you know, as caregivers, I caregived for my mother-in-law for five years. Prior to Matt, I worked as a nurse. I worked as a preschool teacher's aide. Uh, you really have, to, I really enjoy life more now than ever. My brother died um, in 2021. He was undiagnosed at the time. He had memory issues. And he was 67. Matt was 66. I'm going to be 66 in December. I appreciate life so much more now. And folks, if you're a caregiver, you can survive caregiving and you can thrive during caregiving. You can do it. It's a mindset. I was not going to be defeated. And how I got discovered was I used to go in my car, folks, and do videos of raising awareness on early onset Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's showing my husband's picture and talking about caregiving. I didn't think anybody would listen to me. And I put it in all these different Facebook groups, hoping one day I'd be discovered by somebody. And Jeannie White, who's station manager of Passionate World Talk Radio, saw one of my videos, contacted me, uh, interviewed me on her show, asked me to speak weekly in her show that she was starting. So I did that. And then after a year, Jeannie said, Betsy, you should have your own show. I said, no, I can't do that. I don't know how to interview people. <laughs> she said, you'll learn. And um, chatting with Betsy is four years uh, this month. And I have to um, thank Lillian Caldwell, who's CEO of Passionate World Talk Radio, who got me out of my comfort zone. She'd send me press releases of people she wanted me to interview. She said, Betsy, I know you could do it. I wouldn't send you this if I didn't think you could. So I had to thank Lillian Caldwell and Jeannie White for giving me a wonderful opportunity to pay it back because I wish I knew about resources when my husband was alive. I wish I knew. I wish I knew about mental health uh, resources. I wish I knew about resources for caregiving. And I'll give you an example, if you don't mind. I interviewed somebody who would you believe lives in the next town over. She's a elder companion. She's a death doula. I would have hired her if I would have known about her. So I want to help people. That's what my show is about. And, um, I have a great guest. I have a great guest on my show that um, it's not specifically for caregivers, and anyone can benefit from any of my guests. And I'm just grateful and blessed for the opportunity uh, that I have. And thank you again, Christine, for having me on. And if people want to reach me, uh, my email is Sloan, S L O A N, Betsy31 at gmail.com. Also, passionateworldtalkradio.com uh, is my host page. Hashtag uh, kick Alzheimer's ass movement is on Facebook. And of course, I'm on Facebook, Betsy E. Wurzel, W-U-R-Z-E-L. So please reach out to me. Thank you. Uh, so Betsy, oh, uh, this, is, this is something that someone else needs to know. I'm doing better. I'm more lively. I'm, I've taken control. I'm happier now than in years up to this point. And you, this is, you're really good at it. No wonder they wanted you to do that. You really encapsulated your path to this point, your, um, people who, who came forward, encouraged you, things that you wished had happened. And I just see you going, Alzheimer's, you have entered the stadium, but you do not win today. I do. We do. You're here, but we are the victors. I am so proud of you. Ah! And I've been watching you. Uh, I guess it's a long time. <laughs> Excuse me. And grieving, my husband will be gone four years come January 1st. We can integrate our living with grieving. 
And you know what? I have a purpose. I promised Matt when he was dying, I was going to get emotional. Um, I would continue on with my work. <laughs> and when he was alive, and actually I started doing the show in 2018 with Jeannie when Matt was progressing and he would yell <laughs> through the entire show and he would yell, stop talking about me. And then he would say, he called me Booby. Booby, I'm proud of you. So this is my way to honor Matt's memory. And folks, I'm going to tell you this. Like I said, I'm a Jersey girl. You honor your loved one's life if you want to. Celebrate your anniversary. I still do. I get a cake, and my son and I wish Matt a happy birthday. Why can't we honor our loved ones and talk about them? Matt was my inspiration to get in the car. It's because of Matt I have chatting with Betsy. It's because of Matt I created hashtag kick Alzheimer's ass movement. So nobody should ever walk this journey alone during and after caregiving. So I don't want anyone to feel alone like I did for the first 14 years. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Betsy, I missed you. I was in Jersey. Oh, wow. A month, a month and a half after <coughs> you entered widowhood. Just a month and a half. You could have you could have gone with me and taught me how to use the transit system. We don't have that here in Oregon. To uh, I guess we do, but I haven't used it. But I did, and I got to the wrong place, got to the right place, and walked myself all the way over so that I could see the closest spot I could see um, the Statue of Liberty in um, that park. And you could have helped me, and I could have. I could have met you a lot earlier if we had been doing this then. Aaron, welcome. I'm just, did you see, I made a comment on your post. How's your, how's your, um, how's your sound right now? Good. That's it. I just oh. unmuted. You got me? Yes. Fantastic. And uh, people can't see all the comments, but my hubby producer let us know that man of mystery, John Van Beek, has really good sound, but three of us have had um, a tussle with cameras today. John Van B, can you just say hello and tell a little bit about why in the world you would even bother to carve out this hour? Well, thanks, Christine. Sorry, you can't see me. I'm actually talking to StreamYard here, trying to log in on an incognito browser window to, to be seen. But let me answer your question, then we can come back around. But um, after 20 years in a retirement community as the maintenance department, almost uh, entirely myself, I uh, switched over to full-time entertainment for other senior communities around the Portland area. And that's what I do full-time now. <laughs> We're only an hour apart. Right? I can just come see you, or you can come see me. I'm going to plug this right now. I'll have to I'm schedule doing... a summer tour and, and oh, good. get outside yeah. the state. <laughs> no, no, I'm right. I'm at one hour away in Independence. And, and I'm doing an in-person event. It's restricted to only 50 people this year because mm -hmm. I'm practicing. I've never put together anything like this. And here I have eight wonderful speakers who are ready to rock and roll. And it is convergence-experience.com. And a convergence is a little different than conference because it's going to be very interactive. Roger Anunson said, you're saying convergent. That's coming together. I'm, I'm seeing this this way and I'm getting so much advice from wonderful people and I'm, I'm, you know, putting this thing together. So this year I'm going to do the right thing next year, next October, I'm going to do this thing right because I have so many um, really kind experts giving me direction. It's just totally worth it. Aaron, you did an event this week. And you were, um, you looked very different. You had on some different clothing and you were just making things wonderful. Tell us about you um, as far as, wait a minute. You know what? 
I just got so excited about John. I cut him off. Like I just, phew, that is so rude. I'm going to be quiet. John, you're in Portland. I got so excited about no that. Um, <laughs> what, you were a maintenance person. Then you went into entertainment. Be quiet host. Oh, that's totally okay. I have a bit of an echo now because I'm trying to see if I can be admitted on the other um, other window here. Can you see that one? Let me look here. Nope. It's swirling. It's okay. swirling. I, hmm. All right. Uh, I'll answer you. <laughs> two black screens. You are trying so hard. But yes, do answer the question. Cut back to one black screen instead of two. All right. Um, well, let's see. Uh, during the time I was the maintenance person at uh, this uh, 80, 80 bed community, we had memory care, assisted living, and an RCF, which I don't know if that's still a thing. Uh, but I was uh, learning to play guitar, and my parents also did chapel services there. So I would be on site during the week and then come in on Sundays to play music for chapel. And we'd also go to our memory care after the chapel service and just do some hymns. And there was one time that always has stuck with me because we had one resident who was the rest of the week, she was entirely nonverbal, just shuffling the halls with her head down. And Sundays we'd come in and play these songs and she would sing along, sing all the words. And then Monday I'd be back at work and she'd be back to her shuffling around nonverbal state. And it was like, wow, this, you know, music and the memories associated with it is it's a very powerful thing. And just over time, I started to branch out and play for uh, the Providence Elder Place daycare, uh, day center program at the recommendation of one of the performers who would come to our community. And then that kind of started snowballing. And I finally decided, you know, I should maybe give my nine month notice and, and slowly work myself over to full-time music. <laughs> and, and that's how it worked. Oh, I love it. You know, if, if we never get to see you, how can we, is that are there links or so websites or anything? Musicweremember.com and I'll throw it in. It looks like I can't get into the comments, but I'll throw it in the private chat and maybe maybe your husband can rotate Fantastic. it over. Fantastic. Um, Musicweremember.com. Yeah, music we remember .com. And the last three months of so of course th this whole thing came about where I decided to transition to full-time entertainment, right? It, it, it came out that I left my day job right at the end of 2019. So perfect timing for COVID to hit. And then my business is suddenly without any customers who can have me come into their retirement community. So that was exciting. Uh, but at the end of 2022, I was averaging around 80 performances a month with more demand for, uh, for service. So, so, Next year, I'm starting to work with a team of performers that I've handpicked based on their performance skills and ability to interact with residents in a variety of senior living settings. And now we'll be able to get more music to more seniors in more places. Wow. It, it, you, you used that and you, I guess, reinvented, but, but you were just unstoppable. You just moved forward. You knew it was important. Isn't it amazing how each little bubble of, of families like Betsy's and that 80 bed um, community like yours is going, wait a minute, there is something going on with this. This is more than just, um, this would be a nice thing to have some music. There is real life going on when we decide we're just going to do a show. We're just going to continue to reach to people. I'm, I am so grateful for what I know about both of you. Joseph, before we went live, you were, you were talking about people. I think I was writing down some information that you were talking about. Um, let Aaron and Betsy and John get to know you better. Hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Okay, perfect. I'm pressing the mute button on my mic, make sure I'm on it. Easy to hear. Um, 
Joseph Katz. Uh, I run the Prime Life podcast, a co-host with uh, three other people. The Prime Life podcast matches very well with uh, Aging Better Network. We and uh, we we put together the show to help people who are you know 55 plus live better, longer, healthier lives, and whatever that means for them. We cover topics that range from financial abuse and planning for retirement, as well as health and wellness topics. We've had venture capitalists on talking about the growth of age tech products and services uh, and lots of other interesting topics. Uh, you want to say something? No, no. Uh, I, I would. I'm always using my hands. I uh, should have been, I, you know, I'm half Norwegian, but that's okay. People say I should. I should have. I, there might be something else. You know, I may as well check my DNA because <laughs> I, 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 I'm holding my hands down here, and I go, "Oh yes, that's what you were talking about." Was someone in age tech that you were talking with? And yeah, I, that was so kind of you to say that we pair well together. Continue. Yeah, yeah. So we've been running the show now for just over a year. We have recordings scheduled or in the can, so to speak, for another two or three months out, continue to build. So, you know, maybe some of the folks here would join an episode down in the future. Uh, I got into this podcast because I was working in the age tech space for a Medicare company uh, selling Medicare products. And uh, I got interested in the whole ecosystem. And so I've been diving deep. I, I speak to, I don't know, anywhere from, you know, maybe two to 10 people a week who are working in this space. I participate in a clubhouse event that discusses various news related to aging. Uh, so yeah. neck deep in, in the topic. So appreciate you having me here today. Good to meet everyone on the, on the call. Uh, professionally, I am a marketer, so I help businesses grow. I like to say I help companies go from unknown to well-known and uh, put in place, you know, strategic marketing efforts. And uh, I do that, you know, that's where I make my money. I pay my bills. Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> cooking? I, I, I'm not, I, I, I do enjoy cooking, but you know, I wouldn't well, call myself a chef or anything. <laughs> you do it all. Uh, the word that actually jumped out to me was personal, that you were working with Medicare and products, but you had a personal interest that grew. And also that you want people to personally find, create, um, put together the resources to live beyond 55 the way that they want to. And I can attest that coming up to 55, most people did not sit down and go, now, how do I want to age? I might live for another 40, 50 years. How do I want that? You know, the way that we did as we were approaching uh, relationships or parenthood or um, careers or career changes or moving to a different state or country, you know, it's like I need to get advice. I need to um, document some things. I want to make sure that I've got some things in place because every ride has its bumps. Um, but That's most good. people don't approach their age of how do I want to do this? What is this going to be about? And and what do I think about those different topics? So I'm so glad you're doing that. Yeah. What's interesting, I think the way you just described it is most people just sort of happen to fall into you know, their situation, they're not proactive. I mean, it's, you know, human nature, right? So we, we, we bring on guests who are talking about different topics. Like you said, you know, some of the doc documents you need to have in place. You know, sometimes it's just health, like, you know, knowing what your health is and what that means down mm -hmm. the road, right? You know, you may be 55 or 60 or 70, but your biological age may be 90, right? <laughs> there's, there's different things for people to consider and to think about. And obviously, there unfortunately are degenerative diseases that sneak up on people and, you know, being prepared and aware. So we, we try to cover all those topics. And obviously, you know, there's lots of bad folks floating around the internet trying to uh, do evil things. And we try to keep people aware of, you know, frauds and Very how to good. protect themselves. So. Very good. And Prime Life Podcast, do you want to just say right now things that you would love for people to find that you're involved in and ways that you would like for people to find you? 
Sure. I mean, you can find me. My name is J O S E F K A T Z. So one word.com, josephkatz.com. You can find me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, you know, most of the social platforms. Uh, the Prime Life Podcast, I'll, I'll put it into the chat, is primelifepodcast.com. Uh, lots of interesting folks. Uh, we've had some fun times. I, I try to be the a little bit of the clown in the room, if you will. <laughs> Life's too short to be serious all the time. And so uh, usually can find a, me cracking people up at some point on one of the shows. I love it. I, You know what? I switched. Betsy, can you relate to this? I switched and I've started saying, at least in my mind, hey, life's too long not to clown around. Instead of life's too short, you know, grab, grab as fast as you can. It's like, hey, life is going to be a lot longer. What what else can I get myself into? I kind of leverage my age. I've got enough silver and enough um, corrugation, you know, corrugated um, when metal or cardboard is corrugated. It remains flexible, so that's a good thing for me to aim for as a goal, but it's also stronger than when it was just flimsy and flat. So I say to myself, hey, with these, with these extra things, I can be strong in a different way. And sometimes I leverage my age and I go, well, you know, since I am going to be turning 65, I, I tend to be a little, you know, this and that. People are like, oh, okay. And then they just let me do stuff. You know, they're like, oh, she's just, you know. And then I, I, I take advantage of that opportunity when people kind of let me in. And I'm talking in person, like I'm around younger people. And I'm like, well, I'm almost 65, you know. And they're like, oh, <laughs> we better let her do what she wants, you know. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> Oh, no. Hey, Russ Hedge has been saying hi. Russ and Joseph are very similar. There just aren't very many things that Russ isn't involved in right now. And he has said hello and it brought in encouragement a bunch of times. So I am so grateful for him. And Steve Berger also has um, two things that I know of going on. And the one that I always gravitate to is that he is going, there needs to be a hub that Betsy as a conglomerate of Betsy's uh, across the world need a place where they can go to and find what they needed a couple of years ago. So um, Steve Berger is another one to, to check in on there. Aaron, I, I, oh, Hey, John, you've got a face. Okay. We are good with that. Aaron, you are kind of more like I was and Joseph. Was, well, all of us, all of us have done the face to face person to person in I, you know, I used to enter people's private homes and um, as a hired caregiver. And here you are, I would say, in a, a sprawling, large community. Is that right? Community as in like a senior living community? Is that where you are right now? I see that you've got a logo on your shirt. So... I, my entire career, I have worked inside of a senior living community. So I am a, from time I was 19 until last year, I worked inside senior living. I was uh, started as a concierge, then became sales and marketing, and then finished out my career as an executive director in the last 15 some odd years. Um, so what, and through through that i was the primary caregiver for my grandmother um who was my person for 15 years i was blessed enough to have her live at the community that i worked at um for her last year and a half so there's lots of stories we could tell about that um i've had my grandmother-in-law live in my memory care community that i was managing so um, i was blessed to have that and I am also a caregiver to a son with autism that I have to tell you is like a memory care resident. I really do believe that autism and Alzheimer's or dementia kind of are just 
up and down that developmental hill in a different way. And I was blessed to have a career that prepared me for his arrival into my life. And then his experience, my experience as his parent, helped me be a better advocate for my families um, who were having to move a loved one into memory care. But now I um, have kind of taken a bit of a gamble on myself and my experience and taken a little bit of time to decompress from a very, um, you know, challenging career inside senior living and um, wanting to be inspiration and a coach and a motivator towards the senior living industry and also to families like Betsy. One of my favorite part of working in senior living was helping coach the families through their caregiving journey. A, because I had such a personal experience with my own, keeping my loved one home as long as I could, and then finally saying to her, well, she said to me, I need more help. And then I said, yes. And that's when we made the move, right? But I was able to walk through those stages with my own family even though I've spent my entire life inside of a career, I got to literally feel the guilt, right? Even though you're working in it, um, you still feel that feeling. But I also got to see her thrive in a way that um, she was not thriving at home. And her last year and a half was actually her happiest year and a half compared to the prior 10 before that, which to me meant the world. So I have two podcasts. I have one for family members there. I take my experience and I answer questions and talk about things that you need to look for in senior living or how to have the conversation and how to walk through the hard parts and what to do when your loved ones in the hospital. That one is called the um, I Have Fallen and Need Some Help podcast. And then I have my professional podcast where I aim to uh, motivate and mentor and um, inspire people in the senior living industry, which is the Aspire for More with Aaron podcast. And I just want to make a mark on in an industry that I love very much in a positive way and serve that former version of me in a way that would have helped me be a better version of me in that moment. So that's me, a lot of leadership development stuff in the progress, in process right now, and um, wanting to honor the people in the arena. Well, everyone on the screen right now is championing you. They have each found, you know, that's what I want to go into. In college, you find, oh my goodness, I thought I was going to do this, but now I see that this one little course I took off to the side because there was still room. My goodness, that that either takes my focus and refines it, or I didn't realize that I would love doing this so much, but I had to, I had to walk it. Yes. You're amazing. Aww, I am going you. to borrow a quote from my husband, wherever he got it from. And that is at having to do with coaching. And he quoted it this morning on um, a show that he does with Russ Hedge. And that was when you're inside the bottle, you cannot read the label that's on the outside. Mm -hmm. So that's where a coach comes in. And a coach isn't just, hey, you should have, and blah, blah, and yeah, more, more, more. But a coach is a person who's going, okay, the instructions say, you know, the, the best um, opportunity that you have right now, wait a minute, let's stop. Mm -hmm. I see you trying to pour from an empty cup. You are empty. Nothing, you can shake it all you want. Nothing else is going to come out. You you are the priority right now, even though the loved one has constant need. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't. I mean, I'm, I'm just, 
all the things that I've heard from people like you. And like Betsy said, just the next town over, like, oh, I could have, you know, you would have made such a difference to have that other person, other people who are just going, I'm here to support. I have a little bit of something to add to that. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I don't think in the moment, like right when I was in the bottle and I, I'm still in the bottle, right. As a parent who will be a, care, a caregiver for, for a very long time. Right. Um, one thing that I know now that I did not know then, and I think is my main mission that I'm trying to get out. And it's really John Maxwell is what kind of shoved this in my face, right? If you want to add value to people, you have to make yourself more valuable. And I think as caregivers and as leaders, yeah. servant leaders, we have a tendency to give. All we want to do is give. All I did was give. I never wanted to put myself in a position to where I was more valuable than the next because on my team, each of us have an equal value. But if you're in a position to where you're giving to a lot of people, or if you're a spouse, or if you're a mother, right, and you're caregiving and you're constantly giving, you're going to have an empty cup. You just are. And, you know, we have to learn that the hard way for us stubborn folk um, before we realize that, oh, that is actually true. You know, that's actually true. And I used it, I know I hypocritically used it to family members like, you know, Betsy and her situation who, they were in their 80s and one of the spouses was caring for the other and the well spouse was suffering mightily while this cognitively impaired spouse was happy go lucky because you know they're not necessarily aware of the stressors and that's where that quote comes in real handy like what happens if something happens to the well caregiver, you know, what's the backup plan, which is a question that we should all be asking people who may not know that, you know, what is the backup plan if your main caregiver is 85 or 90 years old and something happens to them because they're forgetting to take their medication and they're forgetting to do this because they're so worried about someone else or so busy, you know? So I really take that, now as my motto and wanting to do that and serve people in that way um, because the caregiver needs to make themselves more valuable it's not selfish it's just required really a business-minded person could understand that is yeah. like wait a minute yeah. do do i embody what is necessary it's like no you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of hit on a sensitive subject for someone somewhere, and that is wrestlers when they were told to cut weight, cut weight, cut weight, because then you'll be able to wrestle someone who's lighter and possibly uh, less experienced, etc. And I've heard those wrestlers just go, "Man, I hated that. I was so weak. I got onto the mat and I could barely." move, whether I won or lost, I was miserable. And so, you know, it's just like, is there anything else I can cut out of my life? Is there anything, is there, can I stay awake more hours to make sure that that incident doesn't happen again? Yeah. You may, you may have survived that day, but yeah, I, I understand that the, the weary person who doesn't, I could just go on. Hey, you, t you said something that I noticed as I began um, being a hired caregiver. And that is, uh, and also I watched people in their 90s. And I also watched people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who were the adult children. And I just learned so much from them and the questions that they sent my way. But I was always surprised. Notice I started at 40s because by then you're starting to go talk about, think about aging. 
But what surprises me are people who are all about an older person or groups of older people at age 19. So John and Joseph and Betsy, can you talk to, we're going to start with John, that age when you were like, man, this is important to me. It's not just a job that I got. It isn't, you know, can you talk about that age that you were moving in the direction of um, age-related um, people? Um, John, you talked about your parents. So sure. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you've got like almost two answers to this. <laughs> Maybe. I know um, when uh, I was just around the age of 13, we we actually moved back to Oregon and uh, moved in with my grandparents in in North Portland and so they were you know older than my parents and so it was kind of a a, a large extended family and so you know I was around them all the time and my grandfather passed away I think it was three years later of an inoperable brain tumor and so we had some uh, there was maybe one week where some hospice caregivers came in and, you know, it's kind of, I was seeing a little snapshot of that side of life. Um, but at, we had been looking for another home. And then when my grandfather passed, we decided, well, we'll stay here with my grandmother and, you know, because no sudden changes after something like that. Um, and we ended up just, you know, living there for <laughs> my, my parents still live in that home. And I moved out when I got married. And then the retirement home that I worked at was like a mile away. So I would usually walk to work and um, I'm not sure at what exact age it was like, you know, I felt like I had some sort of calling to serve the senior community, but I, I felt like um, as the maintenance person, it was like, I, I got to be a hero to somebody every day because they were just all so excited that especially the, there were a select group of ladies who would we had uh, we had Comcast cable service for a while and these certain certain residents would always get their TV off of channel three and they couldn't watch their favorite shows. So while they were at lunch, I would quickly run to all their apartments and fix the problem and they would just be delighted that I was mm -hmm. smart enough to fix their TVs. And of course, you know, it was an easy, <laughs> that was an easy thing to do, but to them it meant the world because, you know, they hadn't been able to see the prices right that morning. So uh, <laughs> be, just being able to, to play the role of like, I'm, I'm helping all these people out and they're just delighted. And I really didn't do too much was, you know, appealing to me. <laughs> Well, I'd mean, oh, just like to say, I, let me just say, this is a moment. This is why people inside senior living don't understand how powerful they are, or even outside. It's making ordinary moments extraordinary, right? Yes. I mean, that's, that's the superhero who doesn't wear the cape, right? That's you brought them joy because you did something that they couldn't do. And that feeling is addicting <laughs> it yes and, and here we are we're still in it i know um, right <laughs> the the other thing that i sort of sometimes we would have to change a resident from one room to another and i had a very um what i felt like was a unique approach because everyone would say well just move all their stuff that will fit into the new room down to the new room um but i would you know, carefully figure out where everything was in their existing room and try and mirror it as much as possible. So like they would still be getting out on the same side of the bed they were used to, because at that age you have a, you know, you get a routine and, and any little thing could maybe throw that off and cause a fall. Um, and so they're just little things like that. I sort of picked up over the years as like a personal um, mission statement that was never written down, but it was just like, okay, I need to keep life as similar through these changes as it can be for, for my residents. And um, so I, you know, feel like I carry that into my work today, just provide a, a meaningful experience through music that uh, mm -hmm. is consistent from visit to visit, but a completely different set of songs and now different performers. So Yay. Joseph, for you, um, is this more recent? 
It's definitely more recent, uh, although I've always had some connection to what I would call the retirement part of life through business uh, efforts of one sort or another. But it was about two and a half years ago, I think, when I really started taking a deeper dive and look into this space uh, and seeing what was going on. I mean, if you think about what's happened in the technology space over the last dozen years, it's been primarily focused on products and services for the millennials, the Gen Z populations, and very little has been focused on seniors and older adults and their needs. Because everyone thinks, oh, young, technology, older, (laughs) anti-technology. So there's a gap. And I think there's a lot of businesses that are now popping up to serve this population. We all know that this is the fastest growing population in the country. Um, It's going to have the most money to spend. And so I think companies that are thinking about solving problems that exist for for older adults uh, have an opportunity to, you know, do really well. And so I just started exploring the space and talking to lots of people. And now I talk to people about every topic from A to Z as it relates to uh, aging and senior living. And yeah, it's, uh, it's been interesting. So similar to me, um, it must have been more than 10 years ago. So I would say around 52 years old that, um, My neighbor said, oh, you'd be perfect for the job. I'm so shorthanded. And my response is, I don't know anything about caregiving. That wasn't a focus at all. Grandparents, when they had troubles, you put them into the place that takes care of the troubles. That's all that I knew. I didn't see any, you know, combining. It wasn't part of my world and it wasn't part of my conversations. Um, Even in my late 40s, I didn't. I didn't have these conversations. I wasn't focused there at all. I had been um, a classroom teacher for 16 years, volunteering, momming, you know, that sort of a thing. I worked at a bakery, you know, that's, you know, was a waitress. That was all I knew. And I thought, well, I don't know how to do this. And her response was, I've seen you with our neighbors. You'll be perfect. I can train you. And, and so I started, started into it just thinking, well, my neighbor's a nice person. I'll give it a try. I actually went back to teaching for a little while, and then I went back that direction. I wanted to dive deeper. So it was much later for me. And Betsy, you said that you were a nurse. Yes. Um, I'm so glad to, excuse me, to meet everybody. Erin, I can relate to you. I have to tell you this. My son has special needs. He's on the autistic spectrum also. So I had to learn to advocate for Josh. Yes, I I worked actually in a nursing home when I was 16 and 17. So that was back in 74, 75. And these people were like in their 60s and up. And I was thinking, man, they are old. (laughs) I can't picture being that old. And here I am, going to be 66, and, you know, baby boomers, we're just going to change aging. You know, we're aging better. Um, We don't want to be stuck in warehouse facilities. The smaller group homes, I think, are great. We're not going to want to be sitting in a room with the TV on. Now, when I was a teenager, worked in a nursing home, that's what they did. They would just line these folks up and had the TV on. Not anything they'd want to see would be what the uh, workers wanted to see. I saw a lot of things I should not have seen. Abuse, short staff. I took care of uh, my patients. And everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect from birth to to their end of life. And I, I worked in a uh, state institution for the severely disabled. And I would talk to the client. <laughs> They'd say to me, Sloan, who are you talking to? I said, I'm talking to clients. Don't you know they can't talk? I said, yes, I know, but they can hear. They're human beings. They hear you. And I just loved making them smile, making them laugh. <laughs> and if we can take care 
and from a, you know, treat our children, train our children, I should say, the young age to respect the um, a, their elders and the aging population, the wisdom that children can learn. I took my son to visit his great grandma. My son was always exposed to aging people. He was close to his grandparents. He saw his great grandma. He was wonderful with his dad. He was wonderful with um, his grandma who had Alzheimer's. But, you know, you, you train them. These are your elders to be respected. And in a lot of cultures, especially the Asian Indian culture, which is, um, I live in their community, they take care of their elders at home. We can't always do that, it's not always possible. But, you know, how, do, how would we wanna be treated? And I get really on a soapbox and I don't mean to, but you know what? Because someone is sitting in a wheelchair doesn't mean their brain is gone. Mm -hmm. They have their brain, they're just disabled in, in another way. And I am all for treating people with respect and dignity. Um, think about how you would be treated. And I always say, by the grace of God, go I. The stares that I would get when I was out with Matt was um, terrible. And, you know, we, we really need to train, really. I know we sound redundant. And we can learn from our elders. There's much wisdom there. There's so much wisdom. The difference of cultures is, I'll give you an example. I worked in a daycare uh, preschool and I worked with a woman from India. And uh, Jyoti was 36 at the time, excuse me. <coughs> she said, Betsy, my mom's not here. You're close to my mom's age. Can I get a blessing from you? I said, okay. She bent down to my feet and went like this. She wanted my wisdom. That I was so honored that she thought of me that way. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, in veterans' homes, we don't want to hear their worst stories. Folks, listen to their stories. That's history. These mm -hmm. folks have mm -hmm. rich history and wisdom. Treat them with respect. And um, I have to say, when Erin, you're talking about, you know, caregiving, I have a saying I say in my group, caregiving, I mean, not caregiving, self-care. It's not selfish. It's a matter of life and death, literally, the caregiver's life. If you want to enjoy life after caregiving and you have absolutely every right to do so, we need to take care of ourselves, of yourselves. It's very important. Um, yeah. And I hope I answered that question, but uh, our questions, but thank you for this opportunity. Preach it, Betsy. Preach it. I tell you, oh, <laughs> the people on the screen right now, Joseph and John and Aaron and Betsy, I want to introduce you to a lady who allowed me to come into her living room, yammer on for 90 minutes, and I met her goats through the window. She has come into the chat column, and it is Vicki Schmall. She has also graciously agreed to be a speaker at Convergence, which is scrolling at the bottom of the screen, convergence-experience.com. Wow. So she started the Jero Conference at Oregon State University, the first of its kind, 46 years ago. Oh. I read a whole bunch of stuff on her, but, uh, you know, she's she has not stopped, not, not wavered. Um, but I got to meet her because my husband handed me a plastic card and said, you know you want to go to that conference. Just register. And it was the night before, and I did it and I showed up at 7 a.m. and they served a breakfast after you got your lanyard and I saw a table where I recognized a person from an online thing having to do with AARP Oregon, Jerry Cohen. And so I sat at that table 
And there was this lady going through papers and she, she just basically said, oh, I just introduced people now. And then I learned more and more about her. She has been such an encouragement. I can't wait to just sit and watch other people listen to her. I also want to say hello to Davina. This is fantastic. I am so grateful that you wove your way onto the comments. Oh, this is great. I am just, just starting to meet her. Erin, I feel like I did not give you the chance now that we only have four minutes left to say how you want people to get a hold of you. In your coaching, do you reach out beyond your community? Is this available to yes. everyone? Go right ahead. How do, we, how do we get a hold of you? How do people um, learn more about where you're years of compassion or passion mm -hmm. and compassion are going. So I'm on LinkedIn, which is Erin Thompson. My company's name is Aspire for More with Erin. I help families and I help senior living <clears throat> uh, professionals. So, you know, I have that two sided of the coins, you know, people are like, you have to focus on one, but I'm like, I, one is both to me. That's just who I've served right. my entire life, you know? Um, so aspire for more with Aaron on Facebook. I have a page there. Um, and that one is kind of heavily more family centered, whereas LinkedIn is a little bit more professional centered. Um, but my email is um, Aaron Thompson at aspire for more with Aaron.com. And it's and spelled the girl way, E R I N, the girl way. Aaron. The girl way. Yes, indeed. Is for F O R? Yes. F -O -R. Okie doke. Aspire. You can look for the heart. The heart. The heart. Oh, you have to point to the opposite side and then it works. The opposite. Okay. Yes. The heart. Yay. <laughs> Do it all the time. It's either that or you hold up a book and it's backwards, you know, yeah. and everyone's like, it helps being a, a school teacher because I often read upside down, you know, with the kids and the books and all. I won't be driving um, an RV backwards anytime soon. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> John, you have been a trooper. What would you like to say in these last moments? I would say to keep a smile on your face and a song in your heart until next time and tune in again for more music we remember. <laughs> I like that. He I, I try and close stuff. my little performances with something similar to that every time. Um, the way I do it is sort of like we're on a radio show and you're listening yeah. into a live performance. And yeah. I wonder what song will be in my heart today and I'll remember John Van Beek. Thank you so much for that. I recommend well, Peggy Lee's It's a Good Day for everybody. Oh, oh recommending. All right. I tell you, I would Thanks spend so evenings time. listening to Frank Sinatra or Doris Day singing songs that the people, when I was volunteering, um, the people would be like, don't you know that song? And so I would let Judy Garland teach me. <laughs> <laughs> Bing Crosby, and then get ready the next day and and uh, or the next time and sing with them. How Joseph? What's your, what are your final thoughts here? And you can definitely give your information again. I'll start with the information real quick. It's just Joseph Katz, J O S E F K A T Z dot com. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to loop it back to something Betsy started with, which is appreciate life. I think that was a great message and uh, I, I actually jotted it down. So thank you. And I appreciate being here today and having the conversation. And that's, that's how you KO Alzheimer's. Hey, I'm appreciating life. You don't win. Um, to our two ladies, are you both familiar with Nicole Dawes, D-A-U-Z? She has, she you have heard of her. Um, she has a daughter. She has a book. Something about self-care is at the beginning and the end of the title is And a Kick in the Pants. I think that would relate. Betsy, what are your final thoughts? And after you're done, I'm going to wave goodbye and thank everyone. 
Well, I want to thank you, Christine, for coming on. And as I always end my show on chatting with Betsy with, always um, in a world where you could be anything, to please be kind, shine your light bright, because if we all did that, it would be a much brighter, kinder world. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to uh, Russ and Steve and and Davina and Vicky. Oh, I'm always so encouraged to know that there's someone else gathering value from this and adding value just by being there and encouraging us, letting us know where you're listening from. Goodbye, folks. My goodness, I'm so glad I'm here today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us all. Have a great, great rest of your day and. Uh... Speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.